Hey, Jean, how are you? I'm very well. Congratulations on your opening night a couple of, a couple of nights ago. Thank you very much. Last night, oh, yes, that's right. Exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm always trying to uh, correct people. <laughs> that's why Marg is my alter ego, because I'm always going around. No, you're wrong about that. When I was a really little girl, you know, they call things a print of butter. Did you ever hear of that? It's because they put a print, when you make homemade butter, you call it a print of butter. Oh. And they w wrote on the, on the, thing at the shop, a uh, print of butter so much. And I went in and I said, excuse me, Mr. Lee, you've got a print of butter. It's actually a pint, P-I-N-T. <laughs> so I've been at it for a long time and often completely wrong. That's a good segue because <laughs> I want to get to your youth. But before I do that, i got to ask how you're doing. Because in the last year, I mean, you were supposed to be on this show, but then you had pneumonia twice, then you were hit by a bike which broke several of your ribs. This was here in Toronto. I know. How are you? You seem fine on stage. I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, it was like I got pneumonia, and then I ended up in hospital, and they couldn't, it was one of those things they couldn't cl uh, clean it, clear it up. And by the third week in hospital, I was beginning to become very alarmed because, I mean, you can have your, you can have your organs out, and they put you in a barca lounger, and you're out the door in 24 <laughs> hours. And I was going, oh, this is really serious. Anyway. I did manage to crawl out of hospital and back on my feet and I came up to Toronto to visit my son and we were getting off the streetcar on Queen and John and a, a rogue bicyclist came by and and uh, and knocked me down and broke three of my ribs so then I was laid up for another two months and then I got pneumonia again blah 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 tale of woe and uh, you know so uh, that was a, it was kind of grim. So you do have something in, in, in common with uh, our mayor Rob Ford, antipathy towards cyclists who might. Well, you know, as I that was as I was, uh, actually the guy in the um, in the ambulance uh, at some point on my way to the hospital to Toronto General, there were three people in the ambulance. Two of them said, "Really liked what you do with Rob Ford." He went, "I was in extreme pain. I don't know if you've had ribs broken, but they very uh, they're very painful." And I was kind of in a bit of shock too. Sure. And he went. I'm not sure I agree with the way you went about that. I went, well, I, you know, no, right. I'd like to talk, you know, like he actually wanted to he was start editorializing an on, on your oh, on yeah. the way to the hospital. <laughs> well, maybe that was to make you believe that it's all okay. Yes, you, you're maybe, welcome. perhaps. Uh, the title of this show, Dancing with Rage, suggests anger as a big theme in the show. How, how would you describe the role anger has played in your life? Oh, boy. Well, you know, I think that with all comedians, and not just me, uh, that anger plays a huge role in comedy, doesn't it? I mean, that, that it seems to be the very basis of comedy. It's the it's the yeast uh, that grows, uh, you know, wit, it seems. And, uh, and luckily, uh, like, you know, I think that the whole dancing with rage, you could be killing with rage, I guess. So there's something light about dancing, isn't there? At least you're dancing, right, you know. Right. But, uh, but you are interacting with rage. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And... Uh, you know, I don't know. I suppose rage must have worked for me. And you know what rage comes from, really? I mean, as it turns out, it just comes from fear all the time. You're so fearful. I didn't know that I was just afraid of everything. And every single person and everything in the world I was afraid of. And so that, therefore, I put up a big front of anger, which, you know, did, for a while, tend to drive people back and protect me to a certain degree. And then you get to be a certain age, I guess, or I don't know what happens, but you realize it isn't actually working for you anymore. It's kind of like liquor. First it really helps and you know you're out and it eases that kind of social, you know, dis-ease and uh, and then all of a sudden whoops, it's turned the other way. And I think anger was the same way with me anyway. Okay, a but few I, things you said there. Hang on a second. Yep. So first of all, you've had experience with alcoholism yes, in, in yes, your life. Yep. Uh, do you suggest that the escape of alcohol <laughs> and the escape of anger are similar? I would say that both of them, alcoholism is a disease. I don't think that rageaholism is is counted as a disease. Alcoholism is a real disease, and I believe you're born with it. But I do believe that they take the same path in that, you know, when you're in grade nine, a couple of beers makes you feel like a, you know, part of the gang and like you can really fit in. And, and by the time you're 40, a couple of beers just leads to, you know, 10,000 more or a bottle of chartreuse. But, uh, and, uh, and you're really really on the outside, really, really far on the outside. And you probably were always, even in grade nine, who knows, but it just mm. seemed like that. But with me, the anger thing seemed to work for me for a while. It seemed to protect me for a while. And then it didn't. You know, but then When it you didn't. say anger is based in fear, yeah. the other is, is, is a component of, of the fear you felt. That's, so that's not the same anger, though, as 
being upset at a politician for a tax policy no, and doing no, political no, no, satire no. about it. No, I mean, it's not the same anger that I feel about the vast chasm that's opening up between the rich and the poor and continues to grow deeper and wider, and we don't do anything about it. I How mean, do you characterize that anger, then? Well, I just... Uh, that just seems like common sense to me. I mean, who wouldn't be angry about that? As we see the way things are going, as we see, as we're losing and losing and only 1% of the population who seem to control everything, including, you know, all media, all everything, uh, get, get richer and richer and turn a country that was once, you know, nobody ever pretended that it was perfect or anything, that democracy is like, it's like uh, Winston Churchill said, democracy is a lousy system, but it's the best one we've got. He didn't actually say that, but that's what, uh, it was. that's kind of paraphrasing. But we seem to be turning away from democracy like in the 30s. So I call that kind of anger kind of common sense. That's kind of just like, well, hold on a minute. You know, like, uh, why would we be, why would we be, you know, going in like the Gestapo to people who are getting uh, unemployment insurance, you know, and 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 insisting they show their papers uh, when we're letting, uh, 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 you know, anybody, everybody else slide. Civic-based anger. Yes, civic-based anger. Versus I, a personal... Uh, Rage that yes. comes from fear, concern, insecurity, some of that alcoholism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, you know, a, a need to stay alive, I guess. And feeling that you need to put a big, you know, uh, wall around you in order to keep yourself safe. Well, let me pick up on that. Because, I mean, even big fans of, of your comedy don't necessarily know much about your early life. Uh, and, and it's actually difficult to find. I went back looking at uh, interviews, you, you know... Your stage show does unveil some of this in, in a way. You, in a way. It looks at needing to feel loved and wanted, especially as a child, if that child is you in the show. You could, can, can you talk about a bit about the little girl who lived next door to her family, the story that you read from in the show? Well, you know, it, it, in a way, that is my story. And in a way, it's a fairy tale because it says, once upon a time, there was a little girl who grew up next door to her family, and this is the story she always told herself, Right. So that is so some of the facts are the same. I did actually grow up next door to my family. My mom and dad and my seven brothers and sisters lived at number seven Carter's Hill, and I lived at number nine Carter's Hill with my two aunts and an uncle. I was totally bemused by it all the time. I never understood it. I never had the guts to ask my mother, you know, uh, why. I really, I always was terribly afraid that the answer would be, now this is going to sound totally ludicrous, so please don't uh, scoff, but I was always terribly afraid that the answer was going to be that I was such a, a, a terrible child at eight months. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I, it, you can't put it into real words. Sure. But that fear is always there. Yeah. That the answer is going to be what you always terribly suspected that it was, that there was some awful thing lacking in you. And well, that would be very traumatic for yeah, a child yeah, yeah. to know. But well, why, why were you living not in the, the home of well, your parents? Well, you know, my, uh, my everybody's dead who I could ask that of. And uh, I never really asked it the the real the kind of story is that i had pneumonia when i was eight months old and i went in the hospital and when i came out of the hospital number nine carter seal was a warmer and drier uh, house than mom and dad's house and so i went to stay with that may and Anthony and uncle jack when i got out of hospital but then i don't know did they forget that i was <laughs> there or i don't or know maybe it was I mean, a why healthier... did i stay so didn't did the anger help keep the grief from that time at bay do you think Oh, I think so. You know, I uh, I think so. I, I don't remember being particularly angry when I was growing up or anything. I remember feeling totally outside all the time, you know, like like everybody else was in this warm place and I was out on some kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> this is so melodramatic, you know, out on some kind of darkling plane with the wind. You know, like I never felt a part of, but then they say that that's a thing that addicts always feel not part of. Right. That's a thing that comes, it's like a mental illness. It's a mental and, and, and physical illness. And one of the aspects of it is that you always feel apart and alone. So when does the dancing with rage begin in the, uh, life, in the life of Mary Walsh? Well, I think when, I, I think that, you know, picking up the drink really managed to unlock uh, the, the, the anger, you know? Uh, and when was that? About 14, I guess, mm. you know? And then I had one of those, you know, I guess if anybody knew anything, I, I, I blacked out the first time I ever got drunk, I passed out and blacked out, you know, and uh, and all kinds of humiliating and terrible things happened to me and everything, and yet 
I carried on. Well, I mean, as best I could, you couldn't drink very much when you're 14. You can't get it. But, uh, you know, and yet I carried on and on and on and on way past the point where you would think that. Uh, so, you know, it, it really, and, and people always pay lip service to that it's a disease, but nobody ever really believes it. And even, even people who suffer from the disease find it hard to you know, not go, well, sure, why uh, just stop drinking then? <laughs> Don't have a drink then if it's that bad, you know. But the, the, it is a compulsion and, and a, an illness. How did that illness uh, play with your comedy, with your, your, your natural instincts to be funny, to be a performer, to be the life of the party? Oh, I was really good sometimes. The first few drinks. I, I remember I had a friend, uh, I won't mention his name now, but he's a brilliant satirist. And he, he's, he doesn't drink anymore. But when the first 15 minutes of him drinking was like, it was a year's worth of comedy. And then he would go into Gazoogie Land. And that was it for the rest of the night. And I guess that, uh, and maybe I, I, maybe I thought I was the life of the party. I'm sure I wasn't. I remember Greg Malone, uh, who you know I worked with for years, saying to me, you know, it's always so disappointing to me because I want to talk to Mary Walsh, and then I end up at the party and I'm talking to, I don't know who she is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, so anyway, there you Did go. Did you feel like that was part of the fuel for why you were becoming successful in your comedy? Did you feel like you needed to drink to perform? Oh, no, I never. I only drank and performed once, and it was a disaster. Okay. Yeah, so no, I never drank. I never drank before I performed. <gasps> oh, no, no, no. Too, too, uh, you know, because I could only, I was one of those drinkers. I wasn't a, ever a social drinker. When I drank, I drank. I didn't do anything else. It wasn't like, you know, I have a few drinks at lunch and then I go back to work. And I have a few drinks at lunch and then I keep drinking until the end of the night. You know, I luckily wasn't a bit, you know, a daze at it. But you know what I mean? I it wasn't, wasn't used to soften the edges or, no. or comfort you on stage no, or anything. No, as soon that. as I got off stage, I'd put the bottle on my head as a, you know, as a... Um, um, uh, reward. A reward. Yeah, a celebration. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, coming, I want to come back to the, what, what we were calling the civic anger. <laughs> I, I mean, so so often uh, comedians, and particularly for political satirists, anger or rage seems to be the fuel. And for many years, you and your characters would confront politicians on this hour, 22 minutes. We just heard a bit of that. So was there ever real anger behind that humor? Well, I think that the cuts that uh, Paul Martin... Um, uh, you know, made in 1995. I was very angry about that because the liberals had wrote in on the, uh, on that red book. Uh, I don't think they kept one promise, you know, not one promise that they made in the liberal red book. Do you, I don't know if you remember that. You were only a baby. I do but... remember because there were also cuts to the CBC. I wasn't at the CBC at the time. I was a musician, but I was thinking, yeah. but I, I, I remember that and being upset about it. Fabulous. Moxie Fruvis. That's right. Yeah. I love them. I love them. Are, uh, where are they now? Uh, still living somewhere inside you? Yes. Yes. Well, yeah. not all four of us. No. I am inside <laughs> me, but... But yeah. uh, no, so I, of course there is real anger there and, and, uh, and real anger with the omnibus bills and real anger with what the, conser the conservative agenda, which is really, you know, it, it's like, uh, it's called the Harper government. I still somewhat naively like to refer to it as the government of Canada. Uh, it, it's kind of alarming what's going on, but it's not like it hasn't gone on before. I mean, in the 30s, people turned away from democracy. I mean, in Newfoundland, we gave up our right to self-government and became, and were ruled by eight commissioners or four commissioners or six commissioners, however many there were, out of Whitehall. And um, is it nonpartisan? Do you take would Would you say throughout your career you've taken on all politicians, fair, you know, in a balanced way, or do, do you come from an ideological perspective? I don't feel I have an ideological perspective. I I would like to believe that I have a fairness perspective. I was trying to think. I I kind of knew you were going to ask me that, and you know, the only political party I ever worked for were the progressive conservatives, which they're not called that anymore. Uh, uh, they dropped progressive from their names. I don't know if anybody else noticed that. But back in the 70s or the late 60s, when Joey, it was the 70s, Joey Small would have been in power for 27 years and Frank Moores was running. And I went to work for uh, the Moores campaign. I was working as a kind of, uh, on CBC as a, a, a morning show host at the time. The only response we ever got was somebody wrote in and said, who is the mad giggler <laughs> on from 10 to 11? But anyway, the CBC made me quit working for Frank Morris, and they were quite right, too. But uh, but that is the only party that I've ever worked for, which was, it seemed to me right and fair then that Joey must But in go. your show, you only really attack right-wing politicians. Well, there are only right-wing politicians. Stephen Harper or Rob Ford. Yeah. Or, but you, you, know, I, I, you don't, you're not taking shots at Thomas Mulcair. 
Well, I, I, here's the thing. Uh, I, Thomas Mulcair is not in power. Mm. When Thomas Mulcair gets in power, then I'll be taking shots at Thomas Mulcair. I am taking shots at the people who are in power. I mean, it's the, you know, it's not like the nuns. It's not suck up and kick down. It's actually, you know, it's actually kick up. That's our job, to kick up, you know? And possibly not suck anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but kicking up is kicking up activism? Yes, I guess. So so it's not just entertainment for you. You you want to you, you it, it's Oh, but it's I'm part, not that I, naive. I used to be that naive. But I mean, when we first started doing this hours twenty two minutes, I guess we were all naive. Possibly I shouldn't have been that naive. I was forty years old. But I sort of thought that we really were going to be activists, that we were going to speak truth to power, as you said. But then, sure, right away, politicians were calling us up, asking us to be on the show. I mean, oh, come on. They were using us possibly much more than, than you know, whatever we were saying to them was not having any of the effect that we thought we were having. It was actually giving them a chance to appear as hail fellow well-met people who, you know, beloved by the country. But in your and, show now. Yeah. When you're taking on some of the policies that you you're really upset about uh, yeah. the current federal government or the or the municipal government here in Toronto, as you say, Rob Ford, uh, it, it's funny, but you're clearly making a point that you want to resonate with the audience. You're not just trying to entertain there, right? Ah, <sighs> well, that's an interesting question, Gian. I don't know. I I guess I I. I I definitely I mean, do want to entertain. Too. The audience cheers when you say some of the. You, you, I want to entertain. Like, like a... I don't want to. I mean, I am a slut in a way, an entertainment <laughs> whore, and so I, you know, though I'd like to believe that my heart was pure and true, I really want to entertain. I mean, I'm an actress. I'm out there. I'm looking to get that response. So I'd love to say to you, yes, you know, like I am like Naomi Klein and I am out there on the, you know, I will, you know, but no, that's not true. I'm putting on funny hats and weird costumes and making funny faces and, you know, pretty well doing everything I can do when to get a laugh. When you're at, when you were at CBC, when you were a, a regular member of, of this hour, as 22 minutes, there, there were probably... Uh, if not official, unspoken guidelines that, you know, how far you guys would go and push something. You don't sort of have those guidelines when you're doing your own show. Now you're Mary Walsh. You're you're a Canadian performer that who's beloved. I mean, your show's, you know, it was the night I went anyways, lined up around the block, et cetera. So um, do you, how, how do you navigate the line yourself then? Because there's a moment, for instance, in the show where you put a, a, a puppet of Stephen Harper through a shredder. Yes. Which is a, quite an aggressive act. <laughs> I, uh, so. I did that for years. Connie, that's what Connie used to do with everyone. But first she used to, she had a guillotine, my character, <laughs> character. she used to chop people's heads off. But it seemed more, <laughs> better to shred them, really. I don't know. We moved ahead. <laughs> right. and uh, But right. so that isn't new. So I didn't see that as a big, uh, a big, I mean, that seemed like old news to me, but that's interesting. You've shredded other prime ministers? Oh, my God, I shredded every prime minister and Bill Clinton and even Monica Lewinsky, and I've shredded Dick Cheney and George Bush, and I've shredded, oh, my God, <laughs> uh, endless amounts of people I've shredded, let alone the crowds I've beheaded. You know, so, uh, yeah. Do, no. you, do you, what's your gut check in terms of this is too far, this isn't too far? Well, I'll tell you, um, when I find out, when Marg, in the middle of, of the play, finds out that Stephen Harper might be her love child, in Vancouver, uh, one night in desperation, because as I said, I will do anything for a laugh, I didn't really know, I got kind of lost. And so then I spit when I said his name, and oh, the crowd went mad. And uh, and then when Andy Jones, you know, is a redirector of the show, and when we were, when I was home, I did it, uh, I said, uh, oh, and Andy, uh, I spit now when I say Stephen Harper's name. And Andy went, hmm. <laughs> and uh, I thought, okay, all right then. <laughs> that was just a Vancouver thing. Vancouver, Vancouver is a particular, um, particular uh, crowd for sure. And I, I, I think that, uh, you know, so, so so all it is is timing, isn't it? You just uh, When you, you said the crowd went out. mad, they, the, the, they cheered. Yeah, they Your cheered. Your audience and likes that. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, like they just thought that that was just the best thing since sliced bread. But it was just a cheap move. And, uh, you know, once 
Remember the Duchess, whatever her name was, the red-haired Duchess that nobody was very fond of. Fergie. Fergie. Sarah I Ferguson? ambushed her here at uh, at this at um, CBC, and uh, I was really desperate at the time, and and I I read about her mother abandoning her, and as you you saw the show, and and I always have those abandonment issues too, and she was getting in the elevator, and I didn't have anything to say, and I went, by the way, my mother abandoned me too, <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is it, I will just go anywhere, you know what I mean? I will sell out every. Every single thing that is precious to me in order to get a laugh. And yet people do understand <laughs> it's it's satire. And and you don't spare Rob Ford uh, in, in your in your show. I mentioned him earlier. So so uh, l- let's ask about this, because really this is the first time you've been on the show since the famous incident right. last October. Your ambush interview, or somewhat of an ambush anyway, at his home a year and a half ago, which spun into this massive controversy. Yes. Um, he, he called 911. This which is the mayor calls, of Toronto. Can I just say? Yes. Later that night, that same day that he called 911 because I, a mad woman, ambushed him in, in the dark and frightened his children, there was a nine, another 911 yeah. call from that, uh, from that uh, same place. They called 911 like people call out for pizza. 911 is on speed dial at that house. So it was a very bizarre... You know, I had no idea what I was stepping into there. <laughs> what a pile of... You, you you jokingly say it was in the dark and you scared his children. You contend that it wasn't in the dark. I contend. I don't contend. <laughs> it was 9.15 in the morning and there were no children there. I don't just contend. There is, like, I love this. Now at the CBC, it's like, well, uh, we the, the Jews that? contend there was the Holocaust, but we are there, uh, Mr. Zundel is here and he's saying there isn't, so we have to give both equal. No, 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 I don't contend. The truth is it, it was does 9:15. look quite bright in the video. It does look like it's daytime, it's but I just want to make sure. Sure. In the morning, on the record, yes, and there was no child so, <laughs> involved. So, uh, what, what, what? How do you make sense of this now, with a little bit removed from it, this whole episode and the way it blew up? Everything blows up with Mr. Ford, and not just Mr. Ford, but the the right wing, and not just in this country, but they're up on outrage. They're outraged all the time. They're up on bust. They're their heads are going to explode. They're going to have a massive coronary thrombosis. I mean, you know, there's just everything is outrageous to them. You know, the CBC, the sexual harassment, the one sexual harassment case at the CBC. What the Sun has had that on for what? Every single day, poor Mr. What's his name is marching up and down about, you know. So there's a, a, a sense of outrage, but I guess. Like me, they're more entertainers. And Mr. Ford, it's like I came up as Marg. Uh, my character, Marg, is a big loudmouth yeah. buffoon. And so I thought one big loudmouth buffoon to another. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think that I'm an entertainer. And that's the end of it. I'm not running the fourth largest city in North America. I am an entertainer, and that is the end of it. You can't be electing me or people like me to run things because that's not what we do. You know what I mean? And I think Mr. Ford fits more over with our crowd. And this is something you've done with politicians through the years. We've seen you do it over and over and over and over again. And, yeah. Um, now, what, what about the idea that this was a private home and normally you do it at the House of Commons or right. when Sarah Palin's at a press conference or whatever? Right, right, right. Well, I mean, the problem there was and um, was that Mr. Ford was never seeing anybody. I mean, that's the, another thing with the right and not just in this country. Uh, nobody's allowed to talk to them. Uh, reporters and everybody else are kept behind a yellow wall 44 feet away and the Prime Minister said sends out pictures of himself, and so does Mr. Ford. I mean, it's just, it's just the one thing. So we thought, well, if we could catch him going to uh, work in the morning, you know, on the sidewalk, kind of, you know, uh, that, um, that that would be okay. Um, I guess, uh, you know, people seemed outraged, <laughs> as usual. The um, I don't know who those sidewalks belong to. But anyway, um, uh, it... Uh, it um, and then there was that guy from the Star yes. who was peeking over the yes. peeking over the fence. Another thing yeah. you're not allowed to do. Nine eleven. They're leading a very, very private life, while the rest of us are not, apparently. So, so in the end, was it worth? It? I mean, would do based on all the the snafu that came out of all that? Would do you? Would you, if you have had to replay it? Would you still do it? Look, the uh, Rob Ford you know, thing? I wouldn't. If I knew Mr. Ford then, like I know Mr. Ford now, I, I wouldn't put him through it. I think, um, 
You know what I mean? I had no idea that he's in, like he's practically barking in distress. You know what I mean? I, like in my whole thing of not being like the nuns and not uh, kicking down, I, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I've never gone back. I mean, it's like, but I know 47% of the people of Toronto love Mr. Ford and that's who, that's the, you know, and, and he's the mayor and stuff like that. But he does seem to me to be under a lot of distress. I mean, who wouldn't, when the ethics committee came to you, just pay back the $3,000? Why go through the whole harangue? Mm. I mean, it's like there's no time to do anything except call 911 and be involved in legal cases, you know? So, uh, you know, I, I mean, for myself, I would do it. But for Mr. Ford, I wouldn't. Mayor, if it's okay, I want to ask you about um, a couple of things that are a little more personal and who, uh, not unrelated to the show, too, if, if, before I let you go. I want to go back to your physical health for a moment. Like, uh -huh. one of the characters in this show, um, like that char character, I understand you've been diagnosed with macular degeneration, yes? Yes. And can you explain what that is for people who are unfamiliar with it? Macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in North America. Back in the old days when people went blind, all the old crowd, and they would be go blind like when they were 80 or 90, that actually was macular degeneration. But I got macular degeneration quite young for macular degeneration. And the macular is the thing that is our central vision. And so there are 10 layers of the macular, and what happens with macular degeneration is for some reason or other, the body turns on itself and it sends in little blood vessels. And the blood vessels get in between the layers of the macular, and first that makes lines go uh, wonky, and then they start to leak and it destroys the tissue, so you go blind. But, thanks be to God, I, I didn't. Uh, I had to, two experimental surgeries um, where an actual doctor actually hauled out the offending blood vessels. He actually cut open my eye, something I never hoped to go through again. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, while I was, uh, uh, and um, now they have Lucentis, which is great, a drug that they've developed uh, since, where they just give you a needle in your eye. And, but that does uh, sound like something, uh, I don't want to, even this is an under, understatement, but that, that would be scary to be diagnosed with. Oh my God, yes. Uh, how, did you, how do you cope with that? Well, the first time I got it, somebody broke up with me. And then I spent all my time crying because uh, Dorian Rowe broke up with me. And I remember I said to him, it's terrible to say Dorian's name. I hope he doesn't hear this. And I said, you know, I'm going blind. How can you leave me? He said, well, it's always going to be something, isn't it? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, and at the time it seemed really bad. And then looking back on it, I think... What a great thing for that to have happened because a lot of the time I wasn't thinking about going blind. I was thinking about how heartbroken I was. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it was distracting. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was distracting to have that heartbreak in the midst of it because I'm stupid enough to be spending all my time worrying about that I was being left as opposed to worrying about going blind. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so that got me through the first time. And then the second time, it was the same doctor again, who was Dr. Matthew Thomas, who is a brilliant, brilliant uh, surgeon. And it was just, uh, you know, while I was going on, just before they put me under, we were talking about how Rick had uh, ambushed George Bush and uh, when Bush was running. And uh, we were laughing and he was saying, well, you're going to have to stop uh, telling us, uh, you know, these stories now because, uh, you know, we're go it's a little bit delicate and uh, you're going under. And so there was, the, you know what I mean? I felt kind of safe because I, I was with him. Did the diagnosis change your priorities or the way you look at life at all? No, but it made me wear, have to wear glasses and so I can't read as much. Like you can't read in the bath when you have glasses on because they steam up. <laughs> and so you can't read as much, you know what I mean? So it really put an end to, you know, just nonstop reading. But no, it didn't. It didn't. I guess this last illness really slowed me down and made me realize that there's, you know, a lot more about life and life, life, just living, you know, like, you know, that stupid phrase, it's not, um, what is that? Um, oh, you know, because I'm, I'm a doer and I'm a goer. Like, I like to get up in the morning and just go all day and fall exhausted into bed at night because it's distracting in a way, isn't it? Uh, but then where what I couldn't... What is it distracting you from? It, whatever it is, that the liquor and the anger and the going and the, you know, all that. And, and then when I was forced back upon myself by being in bed for almost a year, mm. there is no it to it, really. It's just, you know, like, I mean, it's all right. I'm all right. You know what I mean? There's nothing to run well, away from, I that, think. That's, that's interesting because I, I wanted to end with that. I mean, the ultimate message in the stage show 
seems to actually be about letting go of anger, even though there's a lot of anger in the show at times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You didn't let go of it all. No, it, it, no, it, no. Uh, so looking at your own life and all the political and social goings on around you, do you find the world more, well, I don't know if you can even answer this question, but more humorous or more rage-provoking these days? Oh, it's like uh, that Mort Saul said when they gave uh, that big, um, uh, what is his name, that awful murderer uh, who used to be the Secretary of State for Nixon, uh, Kissinger, when they gave him the uh, uh, the Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, he said that was the end of of, uh, of satire. That was the end of satire. There was there was nothing you couldn't satire when the when the great murderer got the Peace Prize. But then of course the Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, got a big Peace Prize handed to him by the great murderer, Mr. Kissinger, was on hand in New York. So sometimes, yeah, like uh, sometimes you do think, wow, things are gone so far that what can you? Can, can you send it up? I mean, it's already it's already gone right out to the edge, you know. And uh, so I, I, that's a hard question to answer, John. So you contend that Kissinger is a... <laughs> oh, I contend, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I contend, yeah. <laughs> in, in your... Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to get to talk to you. Nice to talk to you, too.